Hello and welcome to Trash Arts Tick, Season 3, Episode 1, with myself, Ryan, we got Sam, and we got Jackson. Alright. Um, hope you guys managed to have a, a decent Christmas, as much as you possibly could, um, with everything going on, and uh, a decent New Year as well. Um, we're back, guys, and on today's show, Sam's going to bring us up with everything industry, and then Sam had the pleasure of interviewing a Hampshire in the U well Hampshire in the UK filmmaker by the name of Chow Handy. So we're going to listen to that, and then we're going to actually be discussing dystopian films. So without further ado, over to you, Sam, for everything industry. One of my favourite filmmakers, Darren Aronofsky, has finally announced a new film. Um, he had a film like a couple of years ago that he was working on, but that seems to have just disappeared, as most films do with filmmakers. But his new film, he's working with A24, who are one of the great studios that are around, and it's called The Whale. And it stars Brendan Fraser. And it's weird, because like, Arnovsky is known for doing quite a lot of downward spiral kind of films. And this film is a comedy. It's a drama comedy. It's about a very, very obese man who's a recluse who decides to reconnect with his daughter, but it's like 10 years later, and now she's this like sassy teenager. And it's based on the play, and it sounds... It sounds like an interesting curve with Arnovsky, and the last time he did that was with The Wrestler. And that was a great film. Yeah. So I'm in for it. I'm in for anything he wants to do, really, because there's it's been too long since Mother. Yeah, I, I imagine that there's probably a, a lot more to it than that as well, because um, like you think of you think of Mother and, and quite a few of his other films, the the description, the synopsis never really uh, quite captures the the uh, massive conversation mm. that he's having. Try getting me and my accent to say the whale. <laughs> <laughs> Just sounds like a whale. Yeah. Like a, a turning wheel. It'd be cool to see Brendan Fraser back in uh, films as well, in a major role. And again, going to the wrestler, Mickey Rook. Yeah, Launch that, that guy's comeback. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that comeback went straight back downhill because it's Mickey Rook. Uh, but he, Brent, he, did, he had a little run, didn't he? Because he did Iron Man too. Very brief. Like by 2011, when he was doing Immortals, people were like, well, yeah, nah, no okay. one cares anymore. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Brendan Fraser, everyone wants him to have a comeback, so maybe Arnovsky's the guy to give it to him. Netflix are looking to buy more content. Now that everything is all about the streaming wars, a lot has happened within that. The streaming wars. We should make this a thing. <laughs> it might as well be a thing. Oh, I mean, it is a thing. It comes up quite a lot. But basically what's happening is that Amazon, Netflix, all the streaming sites... They're going to spend at least $112 billion this year on content. What is it? Combined or...? Combined, yeah. Uh, Netflix spent $8 billion last year on content. This year, as they released their new snazzy little showreel, they are committed to releasing one brand new film a week. Holy Bloody smokes. hell. It's getting heated, you know, which either means more good content or a lot of crap. Yeah. We'll see. <laughs> All the cinema films, some of them obviously people are holding on to for dear life and being like, no, it's staying for the cinema, it can't be released online. But some others, like Bond, Bond is either going to be delayed to November or MGM is trying to sell it for 600 million. <laughs> and every, none of them are touching it. None of them are going anywhere near 600 million, They're not even going near 300 million for James Bond. MGM are kind of fucked right now trying to sell everything. Their time is unfortunately coming to an end, and this will be their swan song, trying to shift Bond, it's or mad, waiting for a release. It's kind of funny in a way because, like, I love Bond and stuff. Daniel Craig only came back and he got paid a, a shit ton of money. But I know the way that a lot of actors get paid is an upfront payment, and then they get a percentage of whatever the film makes. Mm. So he's come back for the money. And he's probably not going to see all of the money. I just say <laughs> yeah, the yeah. irony. It's very messy. There's another film called The Tomorrow War, which was a Chris Pratt film, which was coming out last Christmas. Big budget film. Directed by the guy who did Lego movie, um, Lego Batman. Oh. I was like, all right, it'd be good. <laughs> who knows? But that's about to sell to Amazon for $200 Because these are big blockbusters. And obviously, to really get these studios to be taking over cinema they need those blockbusters just as much as they need the oscar winning films they need the big blockbusters and when a bunch of them can't screen the cinemas buying time and that's what we're seeing we're seeing mass buying at the moment ben affleck is going to direct a teenage youth adult film for disney called keeper of the lost cities 
and it then it's, it's pretty depressing. That's, ben Affleck is actually a really good director. Generally, he makes good films. Uh, adult films. I mean, the older he's got, and the, the films have got shitter, but now he's going into youth adult novels because he was doing a film about Chinatown, and I reckon, you know, funding. Get in the Disney market. It just doesn't sound... I mean, I read the, the synopsis and I thought, I don't know what that means. I'm not the market for this. <laughs> Telepathic little girls who can interact with alternative worlds that are similar to theirs. I don't know. Just <laughs> just sounds like something you go, oh, cool. Whereas the Chinatown film could have been interesting to, to see the behind the scenes, but because TV Paramount have got their own contrasting thing, clearly the funding fell apart for the film because TV is probably easy to fund nowadays. And finally, talking to funding... It's one of the highlight in Indiegogo. We have um, some filmmakers down south, down in Portsmouth, um, Adam Nelson and Thomas Byron. They have a film called The Mere, or The Maya. Probably The Maya, not The Mere. <laughs> <laughs> the Mere Cat. It's an awesome cult film, and you should see the link on the screen now. If you can go over there and help and support in any sort of way, it's really great to see any kind of filmmaking happening down towards where we live, so we'll always support it if we can. Thank you, Sam. Thanks for industry. So, um... Actually, going back to you, Let's Sam had the pleasure of uh, interviewing the Hampshire filmmaker by the name of Chow Handy, and uh, it was a rather good interview, so without further ado, over to you again, Sam. I'm on Trash Arts Take with Chow Handy. How you doing, man? You good? Yeah, I'm really good, thanks, Sam. Thanks for having me. You're more than welcome, man. This is actually our first interview for the year, so it's cool to get you back on and talking about your career within independent films. Uh, let's jump in with uh, how what got you into filmmaking. Um, I can't, you know what? Actually, my first my first job was a job that I didn't get, and that kind of set me off on the right track. It was when I was sixteen. I went for a job at Elstree Studios, and I, I didn't get it. So uh, I thought, well, I might as well just do it myself then. If I didn't get that job, I can't work at the studio. So I just started messing around, just filming little bits and pieces, putting together kind of rough narratives and uh yeah that was that was how I got started that's quite a good position to be in to not be like de- deterred because you couldn't you know get the studio job to go you know what fuck it I'll keep making films yeah well the thing was it was it was all to do with um it took me about two hours to get to the interview because it was in Elstree it was quite away from where I was living and they said to me how did you get here and I said public transport and they said well you're gonna need a car uh, I was only 16, so I didn't have a car, didn't have a license. Um, but I just thought, oh, it doesn't matter, I can do a two-hour journey. I said to them, it's fine, I don't mind that. I've got nothing else to do, I'll do the two-hour journey. But, um, you know, they weren't having it, obviously. If they can get someone that could turn up in a car, it's probably a lot better for them. So I didn't get the job, but it, it didn't deter me. It just made me think, well, you know what, I'll just start doing my own thing. So what kind of films like influenced you? Or what were the films that you wanted to make when you started thinking about, I want to be a filmmaker? You know what, I, I started really just kind of, um, if I got an idea in my head, I just went with it. So um, if you think about, actually, I don't know if you've seen a short film that we did called Syrup years ago. Um, we shot it on 16 mil, And I just had this idea, it was just about hair, you know, and hair loss and how some men get stressed about it and that kind of thing. Uh, but it turned out very differently when we filmed it. And uh, uh, my my partner, Richard, my business partner, Richard, at the time, he um, submitted it to a horror film festival, which I was like, well, it's not a horror movie. Um, but they, they, they accepted it and they, they screened it. So I thought, oh, OK, well, maybe there is a bit of, maybe there is a bit of horror there. But I don't necessarily think about writing horror films. But I think I must just have quite a, a, a dark mind. So no particular films or anything that like, you know, really made you, you know, the, the kind of films that accidentally like subconsciously leak into our filmmaking where we go, oh shit, that was a bit like that film. None of that film. Yeah, yeah I guess a um, film that had a massive influence on me was um, David Lynch's The Elephant Man. I, I just, uh, I mean, I guess it's a film I've probably seen more than any other film and I never tire of watching it. Um, I just like the aesthetics of it. It was shot in black and white, but um, they, you know, they show Victorian London, but they don't make it into this sort of really stiff costume drama. It's it's just very well done. I mean, it's David Lynch, so he's got his own little twist on it as well. You know, the constant sort of noise of uh, a city in the background. Love that. 
Yeah, so it's, it's it's a very twisted kind of straight, you know, just like straight up story about the how the beauty behind like the ugliness, but in Lynch's beautiful, surreal, strange way. Yeah, exactly. So the film you mentioned um, a minute ago, the short film, was that your first short film? Well, I'd done a few. I'd, I'd actually done a few feature length ones, and um, uh, but it was all shot on VHS. So um, they're knocking around somewhere. Um, but that was the first one that we actually kind of uh, got our act together and thought, well, let's do something properly with this. Let's um, let's let's shoot it on film and let's um, send it off to some festivals. So, what made you want to like dive into features first before short films? Because, like personally, I wanted to dive into features first, and the first features are awful. But I learned a lot more from it. To be honest, I, I was quite ignorant. I didn't really uh, know that much about short films. You know, I'd, I'd only ever seen uh, feature films, you know, growing up as a kid. So I just assumed that all movies were over an hour or so long. <laughs> so that's why I started thinking, OK, well, we'll just make this film. And to be honest, when you look back at them, they're these kind of long rambling things that I could probably edit down to about 20 minutes into a short film. But, um, you know, that's just um, just being young and not really knowing what you're doing. Yeah, that's we we need to make those sort of films. It's better to make them like as many as possible <laughs> to realize that doesn't work. That definitely doesn't work. I should stop doing that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, let's talk about some of your feature films. And um, I've got two in mind that I want to talk about. One obviously has been released, and one is currently in production. But uh, let's talk about the yeah. numbers. Tell us a bit about the numbers. Yeah, well, funny enough, the numbers started off as a short film. And I just kind of got carried away when we were making it. Um, in fact, I think I just I annoyed the hell out of anyone that was involved with it because um, I didn't give anyone a copy of the script because I was still writing it as we were as we were filming. So um, I, it was going to start off as one short film, and then I thought actually I could link something else into this, and then it kind of carried on. And then you know you go on IMDb and it says. Uh, over 45 minutes as a feature film. And I thought, oh, well, we, we're, we're just over that, so I guess it's a feature film. But as you know, some festivals require um, feature films to be over an hour or yeah. over an hour and 20, you know. So it, it varies. Uh, I think one of the best descriptions I heard of it was, uh, was it like, um, like the, the film equivalent of a, a novelette? That is a nice compliment. Yeah. It's a weird one, because like, I'll be honest with you, I've not had the opportunity to watch it, but I know that a lot of the horror on sea kind of crowd, there's a, there's, there's a lot of love for it. For its, uh, From what I get, it's quite a unique experience. Well, I don't know about that. I mean, it's, it's, it's definitely not... Um, I was surprised, actually, because horror on sea was... Uh, you know, I, I basically got... With, with the numbers... Um, once we made it, uh, I was quite ill for a, for a, quite a while afterwards, so I didn't really do do much with it. Uh, I put it up on Amazon just so um, if any of the actors wanted to, you know, say to their friends, oh, I'm, "I'm in a film," you know, because actors people always say, "What are you in? Can I see you in anything?" And I thought, well, that's good. At least they can say, oh, "I'm in a film." It's on Amazon. Mm. But um, I'd sent it off to a bunch of festivals, and I didn't hear anything. And I thought, well, this is just. It's not going anywhere. Um, and then a friend of mine, an actor called James Devereaux, uh, said, oh, there's this great festival called Horror on Sea. And I was thinking, I, you know, I can't afford to send it to another festival. I can't be bothered. It's not going to get accepted. And then he said there's no submission fee to it. So I thought, well, what have I got to lose? Yeah. So it was a real surprise when, I, when, I, when it got accepted there. And it was more of a surprise when I got there because, I mean, as you know, it's uh, it's quite a unique festival. Mm, definitely, it's um it's it's kind of weird, isn't it? Because obviously, like in the last few years, with a lot of the filmmakers who've been going, it's been more of a network, and everyone's chatting and everyone supports each other. Which, before we talk about Tales of Great War, just because it makes more sense chronologically for me, let's talk a bit about your vlogcast because you do a weekly vlogcast where you talk about independent films. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that was, uh, again, that was kind of born out of, um, uh, you know, I was, as I said, I was quite ill for a while, so I was housebound for quite a bit, and um, 
you know, the doctor said to me, you, you need a distraction. You need something to, uh, to get you out, to get you, to give you a motivation. So I thought, I'll try and find some obscure films that I can um, go and watch. And actually, it was, I mean, it's quite good because uh, I started getting to loads of these random films that I just find on Eventbrite, you know, um, free tickets or for a fiver or whatever. Mm. And uh, I remember going along to one with Tina and there was, there was about six of us in the audience. And it was in, it was in um, like a proper cinema, like an Odeon or a Curzon. I, can't, I think it was a Curzon, actually. And I thought, oh, actually, we've, we're a third of the audience, me and Tina, we're a third of the audience here. And I just thought these people have gone to great effort to put on their film and no one's come to see it. And then I thought, oh, I'll just keep, I'll keep doing this every week, just keep going to, to movies. Uh, obscure films that I can find uh, just to kind of show my support for people Mm. uh, because there's a lot going on out there that just doesn't get any form of publicity no I I definitely do yeah so that's kind of where it started from the vlogging then it got a bit carried away because I was going to pack it all in and then I uh, I work as a teacher in a secondary school and um, I went back into to school um, when I was uh, fit enough and um, you know kids are very uh, astute and they found my YouTube channel and then they started critiquing the videos and saying to me well what you need to do is do this um, so in fact probably the first 10 or 12 weeks of videos I'm not actually in front of the camera I just did a narrative a narration over the top um, and then they said to me, oh, you know, you need to sit in front of the camera. You need to address your audience. So I went, OK, all right, let's do that. So, uh, yeah, and then it just kind of carried on from there. You're braver than we are. There's a reason why we're audio only, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I edit the hell out of it, must admit. <laughs> it's been really cool, though, because you have taken the opportunity, especially during, like, 2020, and all that madness, like to be able to showcase some of the films that you saw at film festivals or releases from independent distributors that are like, you know, some really good talent from the UK. Yeah, and again, I think um, Horror on Sea was a bit of a turning point for me because, like I said, I didn't expect it to get accepted. And then when we were there, I, I couldn't believe how many people were just um, friendly and coming up and just chatting and saying, oh, yeah, I liked your film. And, uh, I thought, wow, this is a, uh, this is, there's a real wealth of support there. Mm. And uh, I, I thought, I want to pay some of this back, actually. I want to pay back some of this uh, friendliness, and some of this support that we've been receiving uh, at Horror on Sea to um, some of the, the films, the filmmakers, and the stuff that I'd, uh, I'd seen there. No, it's, it's good, man, and uh, it's kind of led you to, I guess, your next film, which you've released that very cool trailer for the Tales of Great, the Great War. Uh, yeah. Tell us a bit about how that film came together, because it looks, well, epic, you know, there's, there's only one word for it. Yeah, well, thanks, that's, uh, it's, it is, I mean, I can't, I can, I'm thinking I've bitten off more than I can chew, but it, it is actually quite doable, Um I had these these stories that have been going on for a while, and again, I thought I wanted to make them into a movie, and I wanted to do a movie set in World War One. Um, some of the stories came from my dad um, because his dad was was quite old, and he fought in World War One. And uh, I remember um, I got his discharge papers, and on the discharge papers it said surplus to requirements. And I thought, oh, imagine that, you're a human that's gone off to fight for a country that you love and you do two years service, you get gassed, you get shot and then you get a little note saying, thanks, but you're surplus to requirements. You know, I just thought that phrase, surplus to requirements, was just really like, whew. Mm. So yeah, that was the kind of starting point. And then I, I thought... You know, uh, quite often we see in war films, uh, you know, the, 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 the tragedy of war and also the heroics of war. Um, but I kind of wanted to uh, show people that are just there, but they really don't care. They're just doing their job. Um, and the job happens to be that they're in a war situation. And uh, I think about, I think it, that came from 
when I was working as a teacher, well, I'm still working as a teacher, but working as a teacher, you know, there's, um, I've got, I've got no ambition as a teacher to rise up the ranks and become like a head teacher or anything like that. I'm just happy teaching lessons to classes of kids. And I thought, if you, you know, there must have been soldiers like that who are quite happy just doing what they're doing yeah. and have no ambition to uh, be a hero, no ambition to rise up the ranks. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. it kind of came from there and then... Some of the stories my dad told me had a, a slight sort of uh, supernatural element to them. So I thought, oh, I can incorporate all that. And uh, yeah, that, that's, that's where we got to. There's some really awesome locations that you see within the trailer. Where did you shoot it? Like, it, there's a lot of authenticity and because you've got the right costumes there and that. And yeah, it really comes across quite nicely. But yeah, where did you shoot it? Well, I tell you what, we, we shot it in this woods, and um, that was the hardest thing. I mean, I know you did a night shoot recently uh, for Senseless in, in some woods. Yeah. Um, did you just guerrilla shoot that, just out of interest? Yeah, well, yeah, we did actually try to email someone to say, hey, can we film here? They didn't respond, so we thought, well, they've, they've been emailed, you know. So luckily yeah. during lockdown, and well, it was a later stage of lockdown in August, there was no one there throughout any of the days that we were shooting in the woods. It was near enough perfect. Yeah. Because I, I, we, we found out, well, I found it was a real problem trying to get woods to shoot in. Um, we, we went, uh, first of all, we applied to the Forestry Commission and, uh, you know, they made me jump through loads of red tape and, you know, said it was going to cost X amount, um, but then say that there would still be public able to walk through and bearing in mind we're there with a gun. You know, I thought, it's, you know, it's a little bit risky walking around with a shotgun. Um, someone's going to call the police, the armed police are going to show up or whatever. But in the end, I approached this little museum um, called the Ambly Museum here in Sussex, which is it's like sort of a museum that has a, um, shows sort of Britain's work in heritage. So it's, uh, they've got like, it's, it's set in an old quarry and they show traditional crafts there and that kind of thing. Oh, nice. Uh, and they were just really cool about it. They just said, uh, yeah, come in. Come in, What the, you know, how long do you want to be here? Um, so we were there for, for probably about four or five hours. They had a little bit of woods there. And they just gave us free rain, so it was brilliant. And didn't charge us a penny as well, which was really nice. That's amazing. That's the thing, you never know until you ask, do you? You never know when, like, sometimes perfect locations just pop up. And all those things exactly. that you've been stressing with trying to do it, you know, officially. There's always so many problems, you just get that right person, it's a lot easier. Yeah, and in the end, actually, that location was much better than the one that, the Forestry Commission one, where we were going to have to pay a fortune mm. to be there for like four hours um, and have people in high-vis jackets and whatnot, you know what I mean? So, yeah. actually, and, and like you, I approached a couple of other places and didn't get any response, obviously, I think, maybe due to COVID, whatever, but this place, they were brilliant. Absolutely fantastic. That's awesome, man. And you're, uh, you're showcasing a little bit of the film at this year's Horror on Sea, aren't you? Yeah, that's right. It's, um, it's a story within a story. So uh, I thought because of what was going on with COVID, what can we realistically shoot? Um, and obviously it's, I'm in it, but again, it's, it's more to do with um, economics than anything else. It's not that... Uh, I think I'm a, an amazing actor or anything. It's just that I don't have to pay myself to do it. I can just do it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I don't have to, you know, I, I can push myself wherever I want to go with it as well. Mm. Um, so, yeah, it's about a six-minute story that is within one of the other stories. And we're going to show that at Horan uh, this year. Excellent. What date's that? That's on May the 21st. Ah, that's so annoying. I'm there the weekend before, and it's actually my birthday on the 21st. So, Is it? Yeah, bad timing. Uh, I, cannot uh, afford, I cannot afford to do both weekends, but I know that you'll, there'll be loads of the right people there, and it'll get a good yeah. response. Uh, what, what, what have you got screening there? <clears throat> we have the decline screening on the 16th, I believe, on the Sunday at 5 p, 5 a. Oh, Brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. I, I love the festival and it, it's like, I don't know, it's just, it's just such a beautiful community and it's so, so nice to just talk to filmmakers that are all 
just want to make films and not see such a competitive element because no one's there in competition. That's brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, didn't you have about three or four films there last year in 2020? Um, I had, um, we had we had two features and we had a couple of short films, yeah. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, like, yeah. <clears throat> we were probably, we probably were sent too many things in. I think Paul had a chat with me about it and said, maybe don't <laughs> send so many. And I was like, okay, I'll, I'll, learn, my le- I'll learn my lesson the next year. <laughs> Brilliant. So this is my last question for you. I always ask this question, but I always find it's interesting. And try to not think of economic situations. But if you had a dream film or a dream franchise that you'd love to make and work with, what would it be? Um, I think for me, uh, a franchise is a tricky one because I'm not, I'm not too hot on franchises. Um, it could be a story. Just like something that comes from a, you know another origin, or just something you've always wanted to tell, you know. Yeah, I mean, I really, I really want to do a, a, a movie that is. Uh, I mean, it's a bit, it's a bit cliche. There's a lot of it going on at the moment, but set in the eighties and uh, set in a bookshop. Uh, okay. That is, that, I mean, that's my ultimate goal. Um, in fact, I've already written the script for it, but. Uh, Budget-wise, I mean, it, it's, yeah, it's just not doable at the moment. The way you describe it, it sounds like it's the easiest budget possible, but I'm sure there's a lot more than just books and eighties clothes. <laughs> well, this is the thing, is it? It sounds, yeah, that's really easy. Eighties in a bookshop, you know, you're making a film about World War One, for goodness sake. You know, that's, surely that's got to be harder. And, uh, yeah, in theory, it should be. But um, because of the nature of what I want to do, with the uh, film set in the eighties, um, it would probably, uh, yeah, probably cost a lot more. Um, yeah, yeah. So sorry, I'm a bit boring with that because I'm, I'm not really, I don't really have ambitions to. Uh, I mean, franchise. You know, I'd love to, I'd love to do a Star Wars movie. I must admit, if if that opportunity ever arose, I would, I would love to do that. I'm sure, like, uh, if Ryan was here, he'd be very happy to say, very happy hearing that, you know, so. Really? He loves Star Wars and shut up about it. In a, in a nice way, of course. <laughs> really? Well, you know, I mean, a job I had years ago was on The Phantom Menace, you know, the, the kind of, the prequels of Star Wars. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it was, it was bonkers as well. And at that time, I was working in a bookshop in London and uh, I just saw that I used to go to this comic shop every lunchtime and there was just a, an A4 bit of paper on the door saying um, extras required for new Star Wars movie. Phone this number. Nice. And I phoned the number and they said, yeah, come on down. <laughs> and I ended up being an extra in this uh, in The Phantom Menace. Nice. Extra work's always interesting. I am. Um, yeah, it was. In- Sorry. Oh, I was going to say, like, uh, I don't know if you remember when uh, Les Miserables came down to um, Portsmouth back in 2012. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and they had, they had like loads of extras and they were all local. And I got to be an extra and it was a crazy experience. It's just a whole, it's a whole different world as a filmmaker when you see that much, you know, people running around, sec- like second, third, fourth, fifth units. It's insane. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. I mean, it's, you know, their, their tea budget is, is bigger than the budget of anything that I've ever <laughs> done. Always good food, though, you know? Yeah. Well, thank you very much for joining us. That was a weird way to end that. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I know. <laughs> it certainly was. But uh, I really appreciate you coming on the podcast, man. And I hope we can get you back to talk about uh, different films throughout the year. And I hope you have a lovely day. Yeah, and you too, Sam. Thanks for inviting me along. And uh, like I said, I really like what you guys are doing. In, in trash charts and I, I think it's 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 uh, very inspiring what's going on at the moment um, with British indie movies particularly British indie horror uh, pr- particularly British indie zero budget horror mm. I, I think it's just it's just um, thriving at the moment thank you man I hope it continues and I hope like they, we just see more and more voices come out like seeing that everyone's doing it and they've got the support so fingers crossed that happens yeah exactly I hope you have a lovely evening, man, and I will speak to you soon. Yeah, take it easy, Sam. Bye-bye. Take care, bye.
So thanks for that, Sam. Really good. Um, so, yeah, we wanted to discuss dystopian films. And really, our discussion kind of comes from what actually defines a dystopian film. So dystopian, the, word, the term dystopian, it, uh, essentially means an imagined state or society um, that you see a lot of in, in injustice or inequality and in. it's usually uh, shown through like authoritarianism or, or other sort of uh, aspects like uh, uh, just just ways for people to have like uh, you know um, uh, evil control of some kind over other people um, and it can be sort of in the future it can be a, a sort of alternate present it can be set in the past or, or in sort of fantasy it, it's mostly about that sort of social system that you see it's always kind of connected to the sort of times that are going on you know like there's a lot of dystopian cinema in the 80s for example mm -hmm. and of course those are the golden reagan years and you see always like i always think of like this shoddy future because everything's always a bit broken yeah. the, the doors don't work very well i think i always think of um what's it called um total recall Total Recall, everything's got that cheap shoddiness. And I always think if, if we're going to have this great technology in the future, it's going to be pretty shoddy. It's going to be falling apart and collapsing all the time. And I think um, they really pushed that with the 80s. Now, again, the 80s is already a time of excess where there were a lot of things falling apart constantly and just kind of hushed behind and ignored in that respect. And yeah, you see, you see a lot of... Um, in fact, like Paul Verhoeven's work around that time, Robocop, Total Recall... They're all harking to this future where it's either, yeah, it's dictatorially dominated in some sort of way, you know? Yeah. Or there's a falsitude like Total Recall where there's this lovely world, but in reality, the poor people are not experiencing that lovely world. It's just a dream. It's not really there. Yeah. And I think that's sort of what you what you see in society when the, the dystopian... I, I want to call it a genre, but it's not really a genre. It's like an, an aspect that in, in film, I think. Mm. Like, you do have... A dystopian genre as well where films are strictly dystopian but I think that it, it, it plays into many other genres as well um, but yeah during during those times where you see those dystopian films um, uh, a lot more of them come out it always seems like there is like this separation between the idea of what it is uh, what, what life is like and what society is like mm. versus the reality of it and again like you said it, it's like this sort of um, the idea of technology when you see it in an advert compared to how it actually is when you when you have it and uh, things start to break and things don't work so well as, as they are supposed to in this imagined like in this imaginary sort of version. This reminds of it. me of Wish. <laughs> <laughs> Sticking with the um, technology thing, um, yeah, like I know it's not necessarily. I mean, I would, from what how you've defined it, I'd say it was dystopian. But Gremlins Two has a similar thing. It's all set in that big old complex, and none of the technology works very well. The voice command isn't perfect. Things are always collapsing, or people getting stuck in lifts. And but the film's pushing this idea of the future is coming, and the future is coming. And then of course you've got the Gremlins on top of it, who even take science and take you know they start drinking the chemicals, enhancing themselves. And that's only there because of the fact that these things are so... That there's going to be this super mole that has a science lab as well, you know. And there's a TV studio and it has everything. That's um, that whole involving consumerism. And I think um, dystopian cinema it always paints a little bit of a thing to that. Playing into that whole future idea with technology and stuff. Like There's a film called um, Hardwire. And it's made by a guy, Richard Stanley. I was about to say I didn't know his name, but I do know his name. <laughs> <laughs> and it... It's that whole dystopian future where everything's a little bit steampunk. It's always, uh, it always feels like people are constantly having to invent things because nothing works. You take bits of technology and you, you stick them together and it gives this kind of rustic feel. But the film combines that idea that through this, there's this like evil robot that's trying to murder people because the technology is kind of failing on it in itself. And that idea of technology coming back to get us is probably perfectly done in Terminator. And obviously, Terminator is dystopian cinema, but it's that cautionary tale of we've come from this shitty future and we're going to try and fix it by coming back to the past. But you've always got those glimpses of the idea of it. And because robots will always be playing people's minds as being something that could eventually take over. It has not left literature, film, any sort of idea through humanity for a long time that eventually the robots will overtake us. Yeah, well, the, I think that's because there's, the, you know, the, there's been a really obvious um, 
a movement towards that in society anyway with automization of, of like a lot yeah. of people's jobs and, and things like that um you know it's it's something that really that really like you become a, a very I don't know, it's very connected to our reality. It's mm. just that we see it in this more extreme sort of uh, caricatured fashion in, in dystopian future. I think that's why they always, like, I always feel quite um, strongly about good dystopian films that yeah, manage yeah. to really sort of, like, hold up that mirror to our society currently. Well, that's what was quite, kind of cool with Terminator, at least if you go to the beginning, because <clears throat> technology at that point wasn't, you know, skeletal robots, but they bring that really scary kind of horror image of this human that's actually just a skeleton robot that's set out to kill. And then, of course, throughout the franchise, it's slowly the technology becomes more like, a, oh, then the technology went bad, if you remember Terminator 3. <laughs> Which is it's cool in that idea of, oh, look, she can take on technology, but it's just done so badly. Because there is that harm of when you're trying to make things like that, you can fall into an absurdity. When the toaster starts attacking people, yeah. you're, you're falling into a grey area of, is this believable? And I think that that's that's sort of like a distinctly different dystopian future to the um, the the one that we sort of see in Mad Max, uh, where yeah. you've got like the you like you said the technology that's all been sort of spliced together because they've you know can't produce new things, yeah, so they're yeah, just yeah. they're just taking old things. And I think what um, what I really like about that is is the way that uh, if you look at sort of medieval times or times that sort of great empires have fallen and and you know you've had this period of dark ages afterwards, um, they're always taking parts of buildings apart and then putting them you know using them for new buildings and stuff and that you, so that genuinely does happen and there's something very human and and scary about that because mm. it, it does feel like you know, things can happen, things can change, and sometimes we sit in our complacency thinking, you know, life is going to continue the way that it is, and uh, it doesn't always. <laughs> it's interesting with Mad Max, because, like, from watching it, I get the feel that it's probably a hundred, like, hundreds of years set in the future, um, <clears throat> and it gives it this real sort of, I don't know, you, you feel really distant from it, because they've become a lot more um, animalistic, in a way, in terms of the their interactions and oh we worship that like the the guy immortal is immortal it? Joe yeah yeah he's almost seen as a god mm. and then they have these different factions that control different things you got the bullet faction you basically got the gas faction you got the water but the water guy who is immortal Joe seems to have complete control mm. and it's brought it back to this like really really um simplistic way of people thinking like not thinking for themselves i think you see that with um nicholas holt's character throughout the film is that he's constantly trying to get that recognition yeah, yeah, yeah. and then eventually whenever he kind of breaks away from it it's almost oh well hold on there's a different way of living here and i think at one stage he turns around and he's like hope it's like something he didn't even think of before but that that's just quite interesting itself that like whenever you've been given that period of time that period of time then ultimately defines what happens and what they become. And I think I think that's what's interesting about dystopians, it, 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 <clears throat> dystopian film, is that it can really show you what um, people can be under a different uh, set of uh, societal pressures, what what they can succumb to. Because mm. I think we often think that our minds are really really strong, and you know we wouldn't be able to fall into that. But the reality is is that everyone can. And, well, and actually, if they're shown that glimmer of hope or, or that sort of potential for utopia as opposed to this uh, dystopia they uh they might be able to actually come out of it and that's what you see with that character yeah well it's the thing like it's so primal as well when everything collapses and there's nothing left over everyone's gonna go back to the basics that's kind of what um, i was trying to yeah, say yeah total, it's total so nicely resources. done like yeah resources are the total control of of every part of society really mm. especially when it breaks down but then you do have the other kind of dystopia where um, where the absolute control is built out of technology and actually things like work all right and things are, you know... Well, Truman Show. Yeah. Truman Show is that perfect example of that, of thinking your reality is just a little too perfect. And then, of course, it turns out it's a TV show. Mm. You know, it's, it's that twisted thing that you... It's in the name of the film. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it is that real, everything's... It's also a very idealistic, let's say, 1950s America version of everything's okay. 
Whereas, of course, the real bubble is there's a bigger, huge, bigger world that he can't even leave. Like, every time he tries to leave by the sea, there has to be some boat incident or the God in that respect of the creator who controls everything, you know. Mm. Killing and, his dad, give him a fear of water. And yeah, and, and, that, and that's the funny thing, because when, when you think of, um, on a Christian understanding of, um, f or any sort of religious understanding, that God is the one that's controlling everything and all that kind of stuff, mm. dystopian cinema sometimes allows you to go, well, God's not real, but there might be someone that's got more power than you that's controlling all of your actions. And I think Truman Show does a really great job with that. And obviously it's very interesting. It comes out, I think, a year or two before The Matrix, but they're still kind of talking about the same sort of thing, but obviously in very different genres. And it's like you said, dystopian cinema allows you to have that platform to talk about it in various different genres, yeah. depending on what you're trying to teach people, I guess, you know? I think as well there's the, there is a lot of um, dystopian futures, particularly when they're looking at authoritarianism and, and hierarchy like that, where they will have the um, <coughs> character who's in control of the society claiming to be a god of some kind yeah, or, yeah. or um, you know, be above and beyond superior to, to the others around them. Um, and you see it like in, in Mad Max, you see it um, in, uh, or what was the other film you just mentioned? Truman, uh, Truman Show. Show. Um, and you see it in uh, like 1984, for example, yeah. Big Brother is almost a god. I mean, they never say it exactly, but, but that's sort of the feeling that you get mm. from it. I was going to say The Fountain as well. Fountain's, uh, Fountain's an interesting one because it's those different perspectives of reality, isn't it? Yeah, it's I think, I think that it, where it's broken up into three stories, the, the one that's the, um, uh, you know, about uh, him trying to cure her, it's cancer, isn't it, yeah, that she yeah. has? Yeah, when he's trying to cure her cancer. Um, that one seems far more real and not doesn't really fit into that dystopian mold. No, it's but the I think one the, in the... Yeah, the, the, the Moby floating around in a ball. Yes. Yeah, that one. And I think also the, um, the the medieval one where they're searching for the Tree of Life because they're searching for it for a monarch, aren't yeah. they? And that's that's quite dystopian in the first place, that, I, that idea of trying to keep... Uh, uh, you know, a monarch alive for well, forever. Well, in, in some respects, because obviously it plays with the, the mythology of the Spanish, um, what well, the Inquisition of trying to find the Tree of Life and all that, yeah. that. They did. It's like there's reality based within that, but you get lost in what the mythology of it is because yeah. it's legend by this point, you know, of what's real and what's not within that. Mm. Um, but with talking with reality, though, of like, because as you said with Mad Max, you felt a, a disconnection from it in some respects, more like a, oh shit, we want to be in that scenario. Yeah. When you get a film <laughs> like Children of Men, Children yeah. of Men, when you watch it, you're like, ah, oh, that'll never happen. It only takes a bit more maturity and a bit more of living in our current society that you start to feel like, oh shit, this could be an actual thing. Well, that's the thing. I, when Children of Men came out, it, it, like I remember being a bit... So I loved it. I thought it was great. But I thought, like, yeah, it's really over the top and it yeah. could possibly happen. And, and now, as time's gone on, it looks more like, hmm, they, they, well, this, we're not that far from yeah. going to that, that level. <laughs> you can tell from Except just... for, the obviously, the no one being able to have children. That aspect yeah. of yeah. it is uh, obviously uh, fantasy. I don't, I don't know. Like... The, it could happen. There could be some sort of um, chemical thing. You know, if you think about um, women get injections and stuff, and like to for the pill, like contraceptive. Um, but for it to happen universally across the whole world is sort no, of. No, it have to be some massive conspiracy. <laughs> yeah, be, well, this could it. potentially see it happening. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Dystopian cinema can't just point a finger at like completely. This is what could happen. It has to push it to the extreme point where. You almost want to go, turn it off, so you just wake up and be back in reality. Yeah. And through chaos and rioting, um, especially in like Children of Men and stuff, it just feels like society is a war zone constantly. And it gives you a bit of a breath of fresh air afterwards to go, oh God, we're not there yet, but we're close. Mm -hmm. And in some places, of course, around the world, we are in a constant war zone. Yeah. Um, and I think with Children of Men, what what uh, really sort of rings true for me is that is that, you know, the fact that something uh, bad happened that meant that people couldn't have children anymore led to this sort of fascist uh, government being in yeah. control. And uh, I think that that's, that's the, what, what dystopian films do as well, is it, it sort of paints this picture where it says, if these things were to transpire, if, if something was to happen, what way do you think your society would go? And, uh, you know, the evidence points towards the dystopian side quite a lot, unfortunately. Definitely. 
there's um there's another great example of that in high rise because mm. high rise is watching like seeing a whole societal class in one giant building with the richest live up top and the poor supply everything and they're right at the bottom and then seeing that collapse and just seeing everything turn into anarchy and decadence but it's all still under the the eye of thatcher in their alternative reality sort of thing they don't pick like a fictitious one it's thatcher's rule that's led to this kind of class collapse within this building and stuff I'm going to be an arse now, but that's not what anarchy means. You mean <laughs> chaos. <laughs> chaos, if you will. <laughs> but it's interesting, there is always that, it always comes back to if you can compress the idea of dystopia into one building. And I find those films kind of interesting. They're always like giant towers where society is just blocked in and that'll work, but obviously, you know, it's going to collapse. They do that in Hunger Games, but mm. it's different levels, isn't it? Is it different levels? Um so obviously the the richest of the rich live in like the first sector i think it's sectors and then the poorest live in like the other the least end sector and then they had to get selected a champion mm. and then they get put into this park or and they got to literally fight to the death for the entertainment of the hierarchy mm. it's a funny thing as well with game shows game shows fall really easily into dystopian cinema so like when you were talking about that it reminded me of um the, the Japanese classic Battle Royale, yeah. which is a similar story of a bunch of school kids on an island and they're all going to blow up unless they start killing each other. And it's that same sort of horrible kind of, instead of playing with what's rich, and instead of playing with the wealth sense, it's more like the peers. The parents are the ones in charge. They're all part of this. It's all organised. Um, an old Schwarzenegger film as well, uh, Running Man, which is a game show about prisoners who essentially, to get their freedom, they have to take part in this running man challenge. And it's a bit like Gladiator, except from the Gladiator types will kill the prisoners and they have to run from A to B. And it's, it's always interesting when you mix that entertainment value in other people's despair. The hunt as well. Yeah. It's those things that can lead you to go, oh God, we're close to that. We always feel like we're just one step closer to that, you know? Yeah, um, and, and another one that sort of does it in a, in a totally different way is um, Lobster. Yes. Yeah, um, and that sort of, uh, I mean, it's very, very, abs it's an absurdist reality, but it's one that sort of prioritises people who are in relationships and sort of speaks to that sort of aspect of our society that, mm. you know, um, for example, uh, marriage tax laws and stuff like that, you know, all of society is pushed towards making people into a couple, um, which, you know, isn't always right for people. No, I mean... There's, a, there's one depressing factor of all of dystopian cinema. The rich are better than you and they're going to get more. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's the key thing in every bit of dystopian text. It's always powers associated with class or richness. Hmm. And they will always have more than the poor. And the poor will try and fight back from, from, and re revolt. But the system's been there for so long that, you know, you're not going to get the utopia at the end. Yeah. And sometimes well, you do. But it's just funny that, that we keep telling this story and yet society hasn't learned from the stories and gone, maybe the rich being at the top isn't the best idea. Yeah, well, that's, that's the thing, thing is, is, overthrow. is, is hierarchy yeah. can only like really uh, lead to more and more hierarchy, can't it? Because uh, if the, peop the people in power are always going to want to take more power and they will take opportunities where things go wrong to mm. take more power. Think, and that's, like I think, written into like almost all dystopian... Um, uh, dystopian films um, but what I find interesting about the dystopian a lot of dystopian films come out of um, uh, books and it's kind of interesting that, that it seems like there's a lot more of that discussion happening in books before it goes into film one thing um, about that is that where you're always going to have a hierarchy is that even if the the hierarchy in position right now um, gets overthrown by the lower end mm. then the lower end becomes the hierarchy and then sometimes it can create this kind of, I was going to say paradox, not paradox, but um, this never-ending, continuous yeah, like, yeah. thing where, it's oh, like okay, they, they're now in power, but they'll probably want more power because they never had that before. So now you start to get this level again where there's a lower end. Yeah, I mean, I think that's more true when you've got the middle sort of comes up to the top and then you've got a new hierarchy installed. When tends to be uh, yeah in different. cinema it's usually that that underdog the revolution side yeah. isn't it yeah, yeah mad max again being a perfect <laughs> example as soon as they get back to the place what they want to do they want to give the water to everyone mm. instead of going we get the water because we beat immortal joe yeah it's the thing like dystopian cinema will never become unfashionable even when like society feels like it's getting worse and worse and worse 
there is always going to be a much more worse option if we continue doing the bullshit that we're doing, you know? It's kind of interesting because I, I was talking to you earlier about how I can't, I can't think of many utopian films. No. Um, I mean, I think the one that I could think, like the one series that I could think of would be Star Trek. Um, but other than that, <laughs> and, and it's funny because dystopia is, is a word that was invented to be the opposite of utopia. Yeah. So it's kind of interesting that dystopian film has taken a precedent over If anyone over the knows, idea, then, Star Wars? Star Wars is dystopian. If... <laughs> is it? <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Well, there's, they a, there's an evil empire, right? Yeah, controlling they, the... Yeah, but they overthrow the yeah, empire. Yeah, but that's, that's like... Yeah. You can have a dystopian story that has a happy ending. Yeah, know? yeah. It doesn't have to be bleak and miserable. <laughs> if anyone knows any good utopian films, there's probably some trippy 70s films out there. Please yeah. let us know. I would love to watch some more utopian cinema to see if it actually is entertaining. Yeah. To cheer up yeah. our bleak lockdown lives. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the thing, you can't imagine a, a narrative as compelling in a utopian film because the, yeah. the whole sort of struggle isn't there of like trying to overthrow that it's power dynamic. Good. Or, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, so it's yeah, He's, it's harder yeah. to do that like narrative structure of equilibrium, disequilibrium, re-equilibrium. Um, yeah, it's odd. Mm. So guys, we hope you enjoyed the podcast today. As ever, please leave a like, please subscribe, and uh, like Sam said, leave us a comment. Let us know any euphoria. And <laughs> Utopia. Uh, <laughs> euphoria. Euphoria. <laughs> Utopia films um, that you can think of. Uh, guys, we've just updated our website as well, so please check that out. It's www.trasharts.co.uk. Um, We'll probably put a, dis well, a link in the description below. And as ever, Trash Arts Take Out. Ta-da! Please like and subscribe. <laughs> I said that. Did you?